Yeah. We're not far from school. No, nah, school's right down the block. Um, you know, I literally teach my neighbor's kids. So, you know, those sirens right there, you know, probably, I mean, it's a lot of them, so probably means something really popped off. And when we come back on Monday, you know, I'll probably hear about it if I don't hear about it before then. You know, if you don't live on the block, if you don't live in the community, um, there's a way in which you can lose track of that. You know, I mean, I think most teachers know what's going on in Oakland. But if you don't, if it's not part of your own life, there's a way in which I think you can walk into the classroom and be, um, it's remote, you know, and it's more difficult to connect it to um, the lessons and the relationships you have with kids. And it's harder for kids too, because they know, like, you don't really know what's going on. And you don't really know what, um, what we just experienced last night. You know, I mean, I've seen somebody, I watched somebody die right there, you know, sh like shot and just, I watched them bleed out right there, right in front of my eyes. Um, watch somebody else get shot right here. And I have all the resources to cope. You know, I have an excellent income. I have all the advanced degrees. I have all the knowledge of the science about how it's affecting me and how it's affecting my body. And there's certain things that I see or certain sounds that I hear or certain words that are said in a certain sequence that trigger that image in my mind and I, I can't think. Like I, I literally lose track of my thought and I have to like kind of, you know, recover out of it. And I think, you know, damn, if, if I have all these resources and all this knowledge about how my body's reacting and it still, it still stops me sometimes dead in my tracks, What's it like for a 12-year-old? What's it like for a 15-year-old? And what's it like for them to continually be right, re-engaging with that kind of trauma, re-engaging with the sirens, re-engaging with the, the, the sounds and the noise and the words and the images, um, and then come to school and have school talking about test scores? You know, the disconnect is so radicalized, and the, the more violent, the more... When I say violent, I mean all the layers of violence, not just, you know, gun violence, but, you know, verbal abuse and the violence of poverty and the violence of racism and the violence of police brutality and all those things. Um, the radical disconnect between the, the intensity of those experiences in the lives of urban youth and the kinds of things that we are focused on, on attempting to teach them and measure their learning around is so ridiculous. The ways in which we approach schooling in this country with poor kids, particularly poor kids in urban environments, would never be tolerated for middle class or wealthy children. Never. I cannot imagine a scenario whereby Columbine, the day after those shootings, is like, back to the books. You know, come on, we got the you know, big state test tomorrow. And I can't even imagine that. And neither can anybody else, right? It, because, because it's ridiculous to, to think that they would do that. And yeah, that's what we do every day. That's what we do every day in urban schools all over this country. Everybody knows the level of violence that's going on in communities. And every day, it's business as usual. In, in most classrooms, in most schools, and, and no one, no one would tolerate that for their kids if they actually ha felt like they had the power, political, social, economic, to, um, to prevent it. And it's so normalized that it's almost like nobody even thinks to question it. If I were teaching, and this was a common occurrence, I might be tempted to feel uh, a pull to kind of push through the curriculum. You know, I'm not going to get all the way to the civil rights era if we have to stop every couple of days to spend some time talking about what happened over the weekend. You know, so what do you do when? Um, it's going to be a, basically a disruption of the curriculum. Well, first of all, 
um, your curriculum isn't going to work if you don't deal with it. That's why Columbine dealt with it. Because they knew they couldn't push forward with the curriculum. Not, not only is it morally corrupt <laughs> to push forward with the curriculum, but it, it, it actually is, is pedagogically impossible. So, you know, my response to that is, the teacher who says that is, how's that going for you? Mm -hmm. <laughs> right? It's not working, is it? Okay, well then stop. You know, I tell my kids all the time that, you know, one of my favorite Einstein quotes is, that the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. And, but that's what we do, which suggests to me that we don't expect different results in urban schools. That urban schools are not failing. They're doing what they're designed to do. If they weren't, if they were really failing, we would do things radically different because the results are so radically bad that you would be like, you know what? This shit clearly is not even close to working, so torch it. Right? Start all over. Total rethink. That's not what we do. We tinker around the edges. Well, when do you tinker around the edges? You tinker around the edges when you're trying to go from good to great. When you're like, it's pretty good right now. It's a little tinker, little tinker, it's going to be great. Right? And that's what we do in urban schools. So somebody must feel like those schools are pretty good. And good at what? Well, good at doing exactly what they're supposed to do. Prepare kids, like the original constitution of the state of California said that the, the role of schools is to prepare young people for their proper station in life. That's exactly what schools are doing. Is that they're preparing kids for the station in life that they were born into. It is a quasi caste system. And it's only quasi because a few young people are permitted to exit to change their caste. Otherwise it would be a pure caste system. Okay, so fine, you know, fair enough, smart critique, Jeff, now what, right? Well, I think, first of all, total redesign. Like, what's your curriculum for? What's the purpose? Is the purpose to get kids to pass the test? Or is a purpose to um, give kids a set of skills that they can actually use in their lives? Which, by the way, will help them pass the test. Um, I mean, you know, like, who doesn't teach the test? Wealthy schools. Why not? Because they know when you teach the test, you don't score well on the test. That you, you, you score well on the test when you overstand. You don't understand. You overstand. To overstand is to understand something so well you can teach it to others. That's when the test is a joke. So they don't teach you the test because the test is a joke. You know, the, 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 the base level of the test is so low, right? My mentor, Pedro Noguera, says that you don't get ahead by going slower. So we've got, so we're literally remediating kids. We're slowing down the teaching so that they can get ahead. Does that, who does that make sense to? <laughs> so one, you need a total curriculum redesign. If the civil rights, to your, to your example, if the civil rights period is the most significant period in your curriculum, then who says you have to teach chronologically to get to the civil rights period? Then start with the fucking civil rights period, right? Start with the most important shit, right? And then, you know, we, whatever, we can backfill the dumb shit later, right? But let's, let's really start with the stuff that, that has real material significance to young people's lives, right? Um, so A, right, there's a good starting point. How about if you figure out what's really important in your young people's lives, and then start your curriculum there. Like that's the center point, that's the hub around which everything spins out. Every lesson you need to teach that is driven by the state or national curriculum emerges wonderfully out of student experience, real life lived experience, every single lesson. Because no lesson in history that we learned 10 years ago, 50 years ago, 1,000 years ago is not being repeated right now. And if you, if you start 1,000 years ago, right? But if you start right now and kids begin to see, right, the interrelationship between now and they're way more engaged, right? It, it's not rocket science. And, and what I'm saying is not, it's, it's not breakthrough. Go back and read Dewey. Right? For you know, all the sort of folks who want to you know, cite a famous, relatively conservative white scholar, let's look at John Dewey. Right? In 1901, he writes, or 1902 maybe, he writes 
one of his most famous works, and the title of the book is Child in the Curriculum. And his major premise, all curriculum design should start with the child's neighborhood at the center and then emanate out from that, right? You know, he said that a hundred years ago. And everybody's like, oh yeah, that's a good idea. And now, you know, you've got common curriculum, you've got common standards, you've got common textbooks from these common corporations who make common the uncommon. If you just take my lifespan, so, you know, I'm, I'm born in 1971. In that period of time, we went from um, no home computers to, in my elementary school, we had one computer, and it was a green screen Apple IIe. By the time I graduated from high school, no email, right, no internet, none of that. Okay. 40 years later, from no home computer, I have the World Wide Web in my pocket. Almost every book ever published, I can instantly access. And when you walk into schools, they look almost exactly the same in the way they operate and in the way they teach and the way they deliver information as they did when I was born. So kids have gone from, um, I mean, kids are literally walking around with a wealth of the world's knowledge in their pocket on a device they can hold in their hand, and they're being giving worksheets to fill in the blank. It just makes no sense how radically slow schools have been to totally rethink the way they're operating. They're getting their ass kicked by Sony and by Apple and by all these corporations and technology organizations and, and et cetera, popular cultural mechanisms that are winning the hearts and minds of kids while we keep rolling out hardback textbooks. It just makes no sense, but it makes total sense that that kid would be totally disengaged with what we're offering them. Because not only does it not relate to the, the material conditions of their lives, it also doesn't relate to the most basic practices of information delivery in the 21st century, right? So I think that you have to rethink, um, first of all, um, why you're teaching. What is the purpose of the information you're delivering? Then you have to rethink what you're teaching. Then you have to rethink how you're teaching it. What is your method of delivery, okay? And I think what you come to around those things is that young people are already super engaged learners. You know, if you hand a young person, if you take their phone, and you say, okay, you don't get that phone anymore. Here's your new phone, right? And you hand them an iPhone. With what level of intensity do you think they would try to figure that shit out? And with what level of risk and experimentation and, you know, buttons they'd push and fail and redo and all the things we want for them in school, around this device because it can do something that's important to them. So young people are really good learners. It's, it's natural to them. And somehow when they step into the schoolhouse, they're disengaged. Well, is that really then an issue of young people? Or is this an issue of an institution that has failed to tap into the incredible engagement that young people have? And I think that common sense would tell you that it's, it, it's the latter, right? That there's nothing wrong with young people. They're not broken. This is not the crazy generation, blah, blah, blah. Um, this is a generation who, whose lived experiences are so radically different from what we offer them in school that school is quickly becoming irrelevant in their life for very logical reasons. And for the teacher that is um, struggling to, um, to get engagement, um, you know, or, or is like, oh, I have to move the curriculum or whatever it is that they're going to say, um, I think they've, they've, they've got to get their mind wrapped around that reality. The other thing I would add to that is that um, if your only relationship with your kids 
is in that 55 minute block, you're screwed. That you're not going to deal with the murder, the poverty, the um, racism, the police brutality, all that in just solely inside of a 55 minute one period block. It has to be about a set of relationships with your young people over time that spills way beyond the classroom. Right? So there's going to be some kids who don't want to talk about that in the class, but they want to talk about it. So do you create the opportunities for them on a ride home, on a weekend? You know, do you take a kid to a ball game? Do you take a kid to a play? Do you take a kid to a movie? And create an opportunity for dialogue around that. And oftentimes that's where some of the most profound relationship building happens. Because now the teacher-student binary, that naturalized, institutionalized relationship, is, um, is altered. Because now we're both going to see the same movie or we're both going to watch the same ball game. Um, for, for teachers that are trying to figure out, like, well, how do I incorporate murder into the curriculum? You know, it's not really about that, right? It's about a set of skills. Like, is your class about problem solving? Is your class giving them critical thinking skills? Um, which, by the way, we, we have not figured out how to effectively measure on tests. Um, then kids will be able to apply those lessons to what's going on on the block, what's going on in their, in their home, what's going on in their neighborhood.